welcome back. This is our second video. I'm William Bell, and with me is Daniel Rogers uh, from Labor Not in Vain. He's from Piedmont, Alabama, and uh, spending a few days with me here in Memphis, Tennessee. He came up for us to go together to the South Haven uh, Power Lectures, which uh, we were attending until a certain incident, incident occurred uh, this morning. And um, so we want to talk about that a little bit uh, because we understand there will probably be reports out, so we thought maybe you would hear our perspective on it and um, uh, just kind of let you know what happened and uh, what we think about it. All right. So I guess I should start since most of this invo <laughs> involves me. Well, actually, you know, I went yesterday uh, expecting to attend the full week of lectures because I wanted to hear uh, what was being said. And, uh, and so we went yesterday and listened to uh, B.J. Clark, who uh, did uh, a very good presentation in terms of, you know, presenting material. Uh, obviously, I disagreed with his material, and I stated that at the end of his material. I just cordially spoke to him at the end of the uh, presentation when he was in the foyer and uh, asked him if he would be willing to have a public oral debate. And he said yes, under certain conditions, but he didn't want to have it in Memphis. He wanted to have it in Michigan because he felt like uh, there was a lot of activity going on with uh, AD 70 um, uh, in congregations there. And uh, I think he, you know, threw out a number like 25 congregations or so. I'm not sure if yeah. he did. But at any rate, Daniel uh, made some corrections to that in terms of what he was uh, stating. Go ahead if you want to uh, say anything well, about that. Well, the uh, statement that he made on the Gospel Broadcasting Network was what there was 15 to 25 congregations believing uh, the truth on the covenant eschatology in Michigan. And that's, I know, the, I know the figure that he's referring to. He's referring to uh, there's 15 new preachers since the start of the year, in, like from January to March, that had come on board to the, the truth of covenant eschatology. That's what he's referring to, but the person he heard it from got it wrong and thought it was in Michigan for some reason. Okay. So. And, and we don't know exactly how many people are. We know that people continue to do this on a regular basis uh, because they write us, they talk to us, and we're in conversation with them. Uh, but at any rate, we had a very cordial conversation. And um, I uh, said, well, I would agree to debate him. Uh, whether, you know, if we have to go to Michigan, then, you know, to do the debate, I'm willing to do that. And so that's where we left it. And he even said, you know, he wanted to make sure that he wasn't misrepresenting us, and which we appreciated very much, and we told him the same thing. We did not want to misrepresent him, and he said he would like to sit down with us and, and study and, and at least talk about these things to make sure that we are understanding each other. And, you know, I agreed to that. I said that would be great. I'm looking forward to it, and that's how we left that uh, situation. So, uh, and I kind of expected my experience for the entire week to, to pretty much go that route. Um, so we left, you know, at the end of that meeting and uh, came back today, uh, this morning at 9 o'clock to listen to three lectures. Uh, and um, uh, one was on the day and the hour, uh, which we talked about in the first video from uh, Keith Ritchie. Another one was from Will Hanstein. That was the first one, which was on... Um, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. Yeah, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And then uh, Drew Leonard's presentation on AD 70 eraism or something to that effect. And, um, and so we listened to uh, all three of the presentations. Uh, there was no Q&A session involved after any of the lessons. And two of the lessons actually cut off early that even had time for questions, I thought, in my opinion. But they didn't allow any questions, and so uh, at least from the, from the, um, the pulpit. Uh, one lesson cut off particularly at, I think Drew's lesson was over at 1036, if I'm not mistaken, or it was right at the 36th um, minute mark. Um, and I think they had until 15 minutes till the hour to wow. speak. So it was, there were 45 minute lessons. And the other gentleman's lesson was, was early also, Keith Richards. I know that uh, the first gentleman who spoke did his entire uh, message. He actually spoke 47 minutes based on my watch. Yeah, well, he had. Uh, he said he had some allergy problems, so he's probably he's probably speaking a little bit slower okay. than usual. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate, you know, left because there was like a 20 minute inter intermission between uh, Drew Leonard's speech, I think. But anyway, he actually called us out uh, as we stated in the uh, previous video that he called me by name. Uh, he called Daniel by name. Uh, talked about us teaching the 8070 view and how anybody you know, couldn't figure out how anybody would hold this view and several other things that he said. And, you know, those of you who are experienced with this, you know the kind of uh, language that um, is generally stated regarding that. And so it's nothing that we haven't heard before. And uh, so after his lesson, you know, several 
people. Uh, I suppose some of them were MSOP students. And, uh, and then Daniel was there, so I went over to just kind of hear what conversation Daniel was going to have uh, with Drew Leonard. And then I made a statement to him uh, about something that I thought he had said in his speech, which he actually did not. And, and I acknowledged his correction of me on that. I misunderstood him to say something about uh, Revelation in AD 70. And then he came back and made a general statement that was untrue in saying that we always misrepresent them, which is, which is not true. And he was smiling. He might have been halfway joking. At yeah, well, point, he so. probably was at, at any rate. But uh, still, you know, the statement was not true, whether he was joking right, or not. Right, right, sure. um, You know, is the point. And so after that, um, uh, Keith Mosier came up and asked me if I was married. And I said, I asked him the same question, are you? He says, yes, and I have a right to be. And uh, he says, but you don't. And I said, well, it sounds like you might be misunderstanding uh, a text of Scripture. He said, no, I'm not. And um, I said, well, would you like to debate the issue? He said, no. And then he walked away and said, I don't get involved in a puking contest with a buzzard. Uh, I thought that was a rather interesting comment uh, coming from him. Um, but I'm not surprised uh, based on um, some other things. Uh, so I'm, I'm not surprised. And at any rate, he walked away, seeming a little bit um, miffed about the situation. And then the crowd dispersed as far as, you know, our standing there with, uh, with Drew, who was very pleasant, by the way, um, and very cordial. You know, we just all had a very good conversation in terms of, you know, the little uh, interchange that we had. And so after that, I was walking out down the aisle, and I happened to see the first speaker who had raised a couple of questions in my mind. And I just thought I would ask him a question about what um, something he said. And he, uh, go ahead, did you? Yeah, I was going to say, I guess we'll try to keep it chronological. Okay. Uh, as we were walking up the aisle, um, I heard, overheard some guys talking about how ridiculous the 8070 doctrine was. Oh, okay. And there were some guys that looked to be about my age, and then there was an older gentleman standing there, my, you know, my old, he was, you know, I'm 24, so old is 30. So. <laughs> uh, what you trying to say, Daniel? <laughs> well, yeah, you have a large print. Uh, you know, he was a little bit, you know, he was probably middle-aged, maybe in his 30s or whatever, 40s. Uh, and I stopped there, and I was going to let him finish talking so I could uh, interact with him. But I knew that William had headed up the aisle, so I said, well, I'll just give him my business cards. And so I pulled three business cards from my pocket because that's how many were standing there. And I just handed them to the one guy that was uh, kind of out of the conversation, and I said, hey, I believe the 8070 teaching that he talked about. Uh, if y'all have any questions, give these to your friends. I'll answer whatever questions you have, but I got to go. And so I went out uh, to, go, to go be with William. But then I saw that William got <laughs> hung up talking to somebody. So then I uh, went on out to the lobby there for a moment. Uh, and then, well, okay. here's what happened. All right. Well, you know, as I said, I was walking down the aisle, and I hadn't paid that much attention to where Daniel was going. Um, and so about just about uh, maybe 10 steps from the exit, you know, from the door, uh, I saw uh, the brother who spoke first, Brother Will uh, Hanstein. And he had talked about Matthew 7, 21 through 23, uh, with the judgment, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, etc. And he spoke of that as being the judgment. And one of the statements that he made, or the points that he argued in his presentation, was that, uh, these people who were making the claim had worked miracles. And he said, and Jesus attested to that fact, that they had in fact worked miracles. And he might have cited some lexical support as well for that. But his point was that even Jesus acknowledged that they worked miracles. And so I said, well, I have a question about, you know, the point that you made in the lesson. I said, if these were people who performed miracles, and these miracles were operative in the first century. How do you extrapolate or take the judgment of that text outside of the first century? Well, I guess he was anticipating some arguments. I mean, all I'd done was asked him a question. And he said, well, if you take that view, then you're going to um, have to apply all the Bible to them. And uh, so where does that leave us? 
And I said, well, that's not true. And I asked him, I said, don't you believe that miracles ceased in the first century, that uh, miracles were operative in the first century, but they are not operative now, and yet you still apply the scriptures. But he wanted to say that I was being inconsistent. And so I said, well, let me, um, here's, here's how I understand that. I said, Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth would pass away, but my words will not pass away. Heaven and earth being a reference to the fall of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And yet the text says that heaven and earth would pass away, but my words will never pass away. And of course, we've heard arguments on Matthew 24, 29, on Matthew 24, 3, that they were all referring to 70 AD. And then I went to 1 Peter 1 to talk about, in verse 23, to talk about the incorruptible seed, which does not fade away in comparison to the statement that all uh, flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. And so I was about to develop the argument with Isaiah 40. I had cited Isaiah 40 and I was talking about this referred to uh, the coming of John the Baptist and I was going to develop that with Malachi 3 where uh, the messenger would suddenly come to his temple and talk about that coming day of judgment in that application. But I didn't get a chance to do that because at that point uh, Keith Mosher walked back up to me and um, stated that I said everything was fulfilled in 70 AD or that the word of God was finished in 70 AD, something to that effect. And I said, no, that's not what, uh, that's not what I believe. I said, I'm stating that all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, but the word of God is eternal. He said, that's what you say. I said, no, that's what the Bible says. I said, I quoted Matthew 24, 35 and 1 Peter 1, 23. He says, no, that's what you say. I said, no, that's what the Bible said. And I said, I'm having a conversation with this gentleman. And I didn't want to talk to Keith Mosier because he had already said he didn't want to debate. He had already insulted me and uh, made a very uh, negative, um, uh, vile statement regarding uh, a conversation with me. And so I didn't want to have any further conversation with him, and I tried to ignore him, but he kept interrupting and uh, just kept trying to burst in on our conversation. And then he started asking me, will you ever give up this doctrine? Will you ever give up this doctrine? Well, I ignored those comments because I wasn't interested in having a conversation with him. And about that time, uh, the preacher, I think his name was Blackwell or something? Oh, that's one of the elders. Oh, that's one of the elders, okay. Yes came up to me, put his hands physically on me, and said, we want you to leave. And I said, um, would you take your hands off of me? And so he took his hands off of me, and I said, you don't have to touch me. And I said, I know how to leave. And I said, if you want me to leave, I can leave. Well, about that time, about four guys surrounded me. Uh, one guy to my right uh, just basically looked at me, and in the words of David Hester, with blood in his eyes and began uh, pushing his body up against me. He was kind of a big guy with a kind of round belly and pushing his body up against me saying, I'm here to escort you out of the building to your car. And I said, don't touch me. Don't put your hands on me. Uh, and then another guy came from the left side, and I think it was about four guys who were surrounding me uh, ready to, I guess, pick me up and take me out of the building, throw me out of the building. But I, I told them very clearly, don't touch me, don't put your hands on me. And so they backed off, and I said, I will leave. I said, it's no problem. And at that point, I left the building, and on the way out, and I just, you know, made a comment. I said, this is pathetic. And because um, all I was doing was just having a conversation. And then the other, um, I think someone else might have said, yes, this is pathetic. I don't know who that was. Daniel kind of thinks he might have known who said it, but I'm, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't know who that was and wasn't that much concerned about it. And so we left. That was the end of that as far as that was concerned. So it looks like my, you know, attempt to sit and uh, listen to a meeting. And by the way, now, let's put this in a little bit of context. As I mentioned, Drew Leonard called us out four or five times from the pulpit. We did not interrupt his speech. We did not. I, I said amen about four or five times to something he said because he list, listed some things on a chart that we believed. And I said every time he pointed out that statement, I said amen. And every, other people in the audience were saying amen. Um, about to, different things. About different things, <laughs> exactly. 
And so I just said amen and amen and amen and amen because he was accurately representing what we believed, and I stated that. But the point was he called us out publicly. We did not interrupt him. We were not um, uh, unruly in any way. And I think the only other statement I may have made during the conversation, uh, during his presentation, was when he said, uh, imagine that um, uh, Max King tries to parallel 1 Corinthians 15 with Romans 11. He said something to that effect, or, or who would do that? Do you remember that statement? Yeah, and you said Paul did. And I said Paul. And, um, and that was it. But he didn't say it loud. He just said no, it under no, I was breath. actually said Daniel. it under my breath to Daniel. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that was it. So those are the only comments that I made uh, pretty much during, during the, uh, the meeting, and, and we left. And even, you know, Drew made the comment. He says, I have to commend you too, brethren. This was before he ever went up to speak, right? Right. He said, um, you know, I have to commend you, brethren. You got a lot of courage to come into a meeting like this with uh, everybody else opposed to, you know, the views that you believe. Go ahead. Yeah, and he said that from the pulpit as well. Oh, did he? Yeah, he was a, he was a perfect gentleman. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and also, uh, I told you about handing out business cards. We didn't hand out any material. We didn't take yeah, any let, let me let me comment on that. All right. Okay, so... Now, you heard Daniel say that he gave out business cards. I didn't have any business cards with me. I do have some business cards. As a matter of fact, I uh, got them right behind me. But I didn't have any business cards with me. I had no material with me whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I bought two books. One of them was Drew Leonard's book, and the other book was The Power Lectureship. I did not disseminate inform any information other than, and, and again, to put this in perspective, the gentleman that I approached is the isn't he the head of the school of preach of a school of preaching? I'm not entirely sure. I know he works with he, what's formerly called the East Tennessee School. Of exactly. Preaching. It was right. it was the former East Tennessee School of Preaching. Yeah, he's not he's not going after the sons and their daughters. Right. I I didn't I didn't approach any um, uh, preacher student there from the MSOP because I know how protective they are of their students. Now, uh, look, yeah, let me finish. Sorry, I know sorry, you sorry, want to sorry, get sorry. in here <laughs> and. Um, and so, other than to, I spoke to maybe two guys. I was sitting down, you know, having a donut, uh, and we just spoke, and I asked the guy where he's from, and that was pretty much it. And the other guy, I just spoke to him and found out he was from Alabama. He was from a place in Alabama. And I asked him if he knew you, and that was about it. And, uh, and left that because I was paying for a book. I was in line paying for, uh, for Drew Leonard's book, by the way. And, uh, but I never gave out any material. I, I heard recently, I think this is a comment somewhere online, that someone said the reason we got kicked out. Well, let me correct that. We didn't get kicked out. Nope. I got kicked out. I never gave out any material. So if they made, if someone has made a statement that I was disseminating material, it is absolutely false. I had no material. Uh, I think the night before, I had a track in my, uh, in my shirt pocket from where I had attended service, but that was a track on Grace Brings Salvation. Had nothing to do with eschatology necessarily. But, uh, and that's it. But I never passed it out. Uh, that track stayed in my pocket. Um, and I never intended to. But Daniel gave out business cards. I didn't. So I don't know how I got kicked out and he didn't. <laughs> uh, here's the point. My conversation was with a gentleman who spoke publicly on a topic, but this gentleman is the head or the director of what is formerly the East Tennessee School of Preaching. Now, as I understand it, he's in a position where he is under obligation to answer people's questions. Even the Bible tells us to be ready always to give every man an answer. There was no disruption being, being committed. I simply stopped the person to ask a question based on a lesson that he taught. And because of that conversation, and it wasn't the conversation. There is, Will Hanstein did nothing to incite anything as far as I was concerned. We were having a conversation. Naturally, we were disagreeing. That's why I asked the question. But there was nothing that he did, as far as I could see, that created any issue. The issue came with Keith Mosier with Brother Mosher trying to interrupt our conversation repeatedly after I had already told him that I was having a conversation with another gentleman. So it was his rude interruption and insistence 
that he have a conversation with me when I was not interested in having a conversation with me. I mean, after all, after a man insults you the way that he did and then says that he doesn't want to debate, um, so I had no further interest in speaking with him. And I did honestly and um, sincerely want to hear the gentleman's answer to, uh, to the question. And that was pretty much it. But that's how that situation went down as far as I understand it and what I experienced. And uh, I've never had anybody do anything like that uh, to me. Um, I don't think I've ever been kicked out of a meeting. Uh, I have been asked to leave on one other occasion. And at that time, Don Preston was with me. We were at the School of Preaching. <laughs> and it was Keith Mosier at that time. Uh, because at that point, uh, we were in the hallway. I went over to buy a book that Brother Hearn had written on. Uh, I was having the debate with Stephen Wiggins, and I went over to buy this book um, on Sabbath day because Brother Hearn had, had debated a Sabbatarian. And uh, I knew that Steve took some positions on the law that were contradictory, and I just wanted to see what documentation I could get. Well, we were in the hallway. And I spoke to Brother Moshe and said, how are you doing? And he, he made a comment. He said, you call me brother, and, uh, and you know we don't, something to the effect that we don't believe the same thing. And, um, and so he kind of walked away. And I think he might have asked us to leave or something. And then he looked at Don, and he said, uh, he called Don brother something, and Don <laughs> responded back. He said, you call me brother? He says, I believe the same thing he does. <laughs> <laughs> and so we left again cordially, no problem whatsoever. Didn't have to be strong armed. Nobody put their hands on us, et cetera. But today was a very, uh, very unusual situation, and uh, so that's how it turned out. And I thought, you know, it's very unfortunate. But um, hey, you know, what else can you say? That's that's what happened. And if anybody is saying that I distributed any material or gave anybody anything, I would like for them to produce it. Because if I gave it to them, it ought to have my name on it or something related to me so that you can produce that material. And I'm asking you, uh, if you're watching, to produce the material that you claim I distributed when I was there. If you find anybody other than Drew Leonard, B.J. Clark, or uh, Will Hanstein, and Keith Mosier that I spoke to, produce that information. Other than Billy Bland, and that was just a cordial how you doing? I haven't seen him in years because he was in a meeting with me, Garland Elkins, and Curtis Cates some years ago at the School of Preaching. Another relatively cordial meeting. It was all Bible discussion, and that's what it was. And when it was over, everybody left, and there was no problem. Um, that's the only contact I've had. So if you have some material that you claim, if you have a business card of mine, produce it. If you have a tract of mine, Produce it, that it that came from me today or yesterday. Produce it. Where is this evidence claiming that I disseminated any information? If you have any information that I stood up and interrupted anybody's speech, produce it. The only thing you have is me talking to men after they had dismissed, asking them a question about their lesson. And each time I was interrupted rudely by Keith Mosier. And that's what created and set up the scenario for what happened today. Right, and the one, uh, the, the time that you got uh, kicked out of lectureship at was the lunch break, where we were all leaving to go to lunch. Anyways. Exactly. And now the business cards I passed out, that was strictly because those guys were having a conversation and I did not want to interrupt. So I just gave them to the one fella and I gave out three business cards. And if you find those, Share them with your friend. I'm sure you'll have a good conversation <laughs> with me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it wasn't with any intent to, to hurt anybody. I'm 24 years old, so the guy looked my age. You know, so uh, I'm not like mean old veteran William Bell uh, getting the young guys. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when, now we did talk to one guy, uh, but we didn't really talk to him. We said hello to him and introduced ourselves as we were getting donuts. Oh yeah, I mentioned him. I mentioned oh, him. Oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, all I, you know, all I learned from him was that he was from the Bahamas, that he had been in school, he'd been there for about three years. Yeah, and he right? was about to graduate. And, and that was it. I mean, that's, that was the end of our conversation. Yeah. I was too busy eating a donut. And he had, he had a very hot cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's what happened. That's, that's word for word, play by play, what took place at the South Haven uh, lectureship this week. And, you know. All right. It just shows you that they trust the carnal uh, weapons of their warfare 
more than they trust the spiritual weapons. Of yeah, I mean, it was like a, 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 what do you call these, tax squads or, or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it was, it was, you know, just quite a bizarre uh, situation. Well, uh, what's, that, sho what's shocking to me is that, you know, there was a time not, you know, just a few years ago. I mean, you look back to the 70s. And Gus Nichols would get up and give his presentation on the Holy Spirit, and Guy and Woods would have to go right up there and disagree with him. Or, you know, same thing with uh, uh, Brother Nichols and Brother Deaver when it came to divorce. They had no problem with standing up and debating these, these hot issues uh, right there at open forum. But it wasn't even open forum. It wasn't even in front of everybody. It was a private conversation. And apparently, those are too scary for uh, those yeah. men to do. And with. you know what was interesting? <laughs> I attended a meeting this past Sunday with uh, Geno Jennings. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Anyway, he's a... Um, um, uh, what do you call apostolic uh, preacher, Jesus only uh, preacher, oh. but very popular, et cetera. So he was in Memphis, and uh, we had sent him some materials uh, for him to consider. And so I just went to have a conversation with him to see if he had uh, had any time to read our materials. And uh, he spoke, and right in the meeting, before his first thing when he got up on the floor, he says, does anybody have any questions? And all around the audience, people started, as a matter of fact, his entire lesson was answering the questions of the audience. And he didn't know who was asking questions. I was about the last person to, you know, because I was my first time in the meeting, so I just kind of sat there and, and, uh, and I didn't want to uh, create anything that might interrupt or, or antagonize a relationship that I wanted to try to build to, to have a conversation with him. But he never, ever refused to, uh, to take anybody's question uh, that was in the, office, in, in the audience. And this was live uh, from that. He didn't know who was in the audience. He didn't know I was there. And so I went up afterwards and introduced myself to him and told him that, you know, I was the guy who had sent him some materials and Don and I, you know, had sent him some materials. And he said, well, we'll get together and we'll, we'll study it. You know, whether you will or not, I don't know. But I just went and uh, it's a total different experience. Well, that's the way I was taught to teach Bible class. You know, my granddad always got up and said, anybody have any Bible questions? And I mean, I've done that ever since I started preaching. Mm -hmm. I always start off asking if anybody has questions. Yeah. That's, you know. That's what you're there for. You're there to answer questions and to teach the truth and be always ready to give an answer. And if you're not ready enough that you have to kick somebody out of a lectureship, well, that's, that's just very telling. Yeah. Um, it's a shame, honestly. Just very much so a shame. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that wraps this up. And um, as you can see, you know, it's been quite an eventful uh, morning, uh, but um, <laughs> it's only the first, day, the first full day of the lectureship, and William's already been kicked out. <laughs> all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us at William Bell with All Things Fulfilled and uh, Daniel Rogers with Labor Not in Vain. Uh, enjoying having him around. And, and by the way, you know Daniel's a pretty good guitar player. We <laughs> we kicked it around last night, a lot uh, playing a lot of blues and and uh, uh, Name some of those songs that you, you had me learning. Oh, we played uh, Steve Ray Vaughan's Pride and Joy. All right. We played uh, Sunshine of Your Love by, Cre by Cream. We just played some just and regular Sweet old... Home Alabama. And... <laughs> yeah, we oh, Sweet yeah. We were... <laughs> and, uh, he taught me some Marvin Gaye, so we had, a, we had a good time. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. And uh, maybe we'll go play some more guitar or something. It's, that's a lot more fun. Don't Sounds you good to me. All right. All right. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. I'm William Bell. This is Daniel Rogers. Have a good day.